It's an extremely dysfunctional society and governments can change their regulation and seize your gold at any point of time. Print too much of currency notes. People would simply dump the currency notes and buy gold and silver. You can't really trust governments anymore. You should have never trusted your government. Just to update you, we will be doing a live stream on the 16th of June at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please join me for conversation about current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, join me on the 16th of June at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for our next live stream. Hope to see you there. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Friendly reminder, if you are new to this channel or have not already done so, please do subscribe, click on the bell to be notified on updates, and give us a thumbs up if you like this video. It really helps us a lot. Our guest today is Jayant Bandari, a well-known financial analyst and investment advisor from Anarcho Capital. Jayant advises institutional investors on opportunities, particularly in the natural resource sector. And we are delighted to have him back here again as a return guest. Good day, Jayant, and welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Right. Sounds good. Jayant, I, I read a recent report where the World Gold Council, uh, they stated that Indian households are the world's largest holders of gold. Collectively, they hold between uh, some twenty four to 25,000 tons of gold, and that's more than the gold holdings of the top 10 countries. Uh, given that most of our listeners are not from India, can you help us understand Indians' love for gold and what the yellow metal means to them? Uh, well, that is not actually a very good statement to make because uh, India is a massive country. It has a population of 1.35 billion people. On per capita basis, there are a lot of other countries that actually consume more gold than India does. And that is what we should actually look at. Uh, people of Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia consume a lot more gold. And in fact, even the United States people consume more gold on per capita basis. Uh, that said, India does consume a huge amount of gold. And the reason Indians consume so much gold is because it's an extremely dysfunctional society. Uh, Preserving your wealth is a Herculean task in India. Uh, your wealth has a tendency to get destroyed very rapidly. It is as if the heat of the country destroys your wealth very rapidly with time. The end result is that most people who have savings have only two ways to protect their properties. One is to buy prop uh, protect their wealth. One is to buy property and one is to buy gold. Uh, now, there has been a huge amount of euphoria related with property over the last two or three decades, which is now waning because property prices have fallen quite a bit. Um, but uh, gold continues to be one of the prime places for Indians to uh, preserve their wealth through. Where do Indians store their gold? Do they keep it at home or is it kept in a safe deposit box or is it hidden in plain sight? Um, all three of those uh, depends what your intentions are, whether you have safe spaces to dug within your own houses to preserve your gold. Um, you might want to keep that some of the gold in, in bank lockers, but it is an extremely risky way to protect your wealth because government banks are extremely untrustworthy and governments can change their regulation and seize your gold at any point of time. And a lot of Indians are aware of this thing. So what they do is that they actually pretty much dug a place in their house, if they don't live in apartments, if they live in proper houses, then they can dug a place within their houses and then uh, hide go their gold in their houses. Okay. Are they um, are they hiding jewelry or bullion? Um, which, which type of gold are, are they putting there? Uh, I think all kinds of okay. things, but uh, mostly it has to be bullion because jewelry would probably get uh, destroyed by uh, the dampness of the underground uh, underground uh, ecology. So what you want is to store bullion and coins underground, which is what most people, I think, do. You touched on it a bit 
uh, is it fair to say that most Indians trust gold more than the rupee? Of course, no one trusts the rupee, uh, Patrick. And this is this is actually very interesting because the reason India does not have hyperinflation is that Indians simply don't trust the rupee. If Indian government ever decided to print too much of currency notes, people would simply dump the currency notes and buy gold and silver. And that is exactly why Indian government has this uh, very good feedback mechanism to ensure that they don't take the path of hyperinflation the way Argentina or Brazil or several other countries have taken in the past. How about the U.S. dollar? Do, do they trust the U.S. dollar or any uh, fiat for that matter? Absolutely. I mean, U.S. dollar and euro are like gold for a lot of Indians, uh, but they don't re necessarily have access to U.S. dollar and euros, mostly because they are still thinking that India controls uh, uh, keeping your wealth in U.S. dollar and euros. Those controls have gone away mostly, but Indians are very paranoid about holding uh, foreign currency. And also courts, in case you are caught with U.S. dollars and euros, take a more negative view of you because they then want to think that you have been in doing some money laundering. So uh, people are worried about keeping U.S. dollars and euro, but uh, people do keep... a fair bit of their money in euros and US dollars, including in uh, bank accounts outside the country. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there was also a recent article from The Economist highlighting that a third of Indians uh, are 18 to 35 year olds, that they often prefer to buy electronic gadgets rather than gold. Uh, the yellow metal is also no longer a sign of wealth, but more of fashion. Is this your observation as well? Uh, is the economist correct with what they're what they're stating? Uh, absolutely, I think they are fairly correct in stating that um, the young population of India has imported a lot of bad ideas from the Western societies. They have failed to import good qualities of the Western society, the good qualities of Western civilization. They have imported Kim Kardashian kind of stuff to India, and the end result is that. Uh, Indians, young Indians have become extremely hedonistic uh, and materialistic. So they don't even have the tendency to save money. Um, India is an extraordinarily indebted society today, and young people spend more than they, that they earn, which is going to come and haunt them at some point of time in the future. I also read a, a recent post on your website titled The Decline of India, and you described India as a low trust society just as you're 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 speaking about here can you give us uh, some context as to why you say that and is this lack of trust a reason for indians to want to secure their their wealth and gold well that is only part of the whole package indian don't indians don't trust their own family and friends forget about trusting uh, the guy on the street there is virtually no trust in that society, but that is a part of the whole package. At a more fundamental level, India is an extremely dysfunctional society, an extremely tribal, superstitious, and irrational society where no one trusts anyone else. Uh, the economy does not work, so people like to keep their wealth in gold, but because they can't think rationally, they can't really have a rational association with other people. Friendships are uh, dependency relationships. Families are dependency relationships, if at all they work. But because of this dysfunctionality, people actually trust no one. And that is why when they hide their gold from public eye, they also hide their gold from their own friends and family. That is the low level of trust that that society has within it. How about when uh, when you were growing up? I, I'd imagine the trust level was a bit higher. What, what would be the difference between then and now? Uh, I think the, the society is be certainly becoming more dysfunctional as time has gone by because materialism and hedonism has hit that country. An increase in wealth and increase in education has not helped. Uh, the problem is that if the society is, stays uh, irrational, the underlying aspect of the society stays irrational. You can 
use tools of education and technology to make things worse. So yes, the society has bo- become worse as time has gone by. Um, and again, uh, because government is trying to make people nationalistic, Hindu fanaticism is go- growing up. Um, also, Muslim fanaticism is getting worse as well, which has always been there. The end result is that the society is less trusting today than it used to be in the past. Speaking about uh, trust, uh, 2016, um, we saw the demonetization um, of the rupee. India's government banned the use of the 500 rupee and the 1,000 rupee banknotes. Uh, but these denominations are the highest value banknotes and the ban therefore made most currency in use illegal. Uh, for our listeners who may not be familiar with this demonetization event in India, can you share with us why the government made such a move and the impact on society? Modi, Narendra Modi, the Indian Prime Minister in November 2016, came on the television to announce that 86% of Indian currency would no longer be legal tender after midnight that day, which meant that the next day people pretty much had no way to transact with each other. Most of the Indian economy has historically been a cash-based economy, and there's a reason behind it. It's not just because people are into money laundering or avoiding taxes. The problem is that people of India are so backward and so uneducated and so lacking in trust that they don't trust the plastic card, they don't trust the banking system, Uh, And in fact, you shouldn't trust them anyway because the banking system is extremely dysfunctional. I lose money from my account all the time, uh, really, Patrick, and I don't care about it because it's not worth my time to chase the banks to recover the cash that disappeared from my account. Uh, Now, given that situation, uh, people like to use cash, but government wanted to force them into the formal economy. They wanted people to start using the banking system, which most Indians are simply incapable of using. Uh, So that destroyed the backbone of the economy. And the government thinks that just because of this regulatory changes, they could force people to take the path of formal economy, which wasn't going to happen. So the economy got destroyed and it continues to stagnate and falter. Okay, when you say um, most Indians can't use a, a banking system, is it because of the, the infrastructure of the banking system or is it something else? Uh, well, remember, uh, a large chunk of India still doesn't have electricity. They don't right. have internet. So how are you going to use your ATM card when the ATM machines are not working? So that's one simple thing. Uh, but also the banking system infrastructure is very bad. The simple websites of banks don't work properly. Um, Many times I send money from my bank to charge my uh, mobile phone uh, account, uh, and that money never arrives to my mobile phone account. Uh, And I have had those kind of disappearances of my cash many times in the past. Um, And when it's a larger amount of money, I fight for it to get that money recovered. But if it's something like 10 or 15 or $20, Patrick, it's not worth my time to chase the banks. Uh, Their helplines don't work. So no one picks up the phone. If they pick up the phone, they don't do what they promise to do. So if I have to get anything sorted out, I have to keep going to the bank every single day to make sure my file moves and my complaint moves forward. Um, And this is not going to change, uh, Patrick, uh, because the problem is that it's an extremely dysfunctional society. And as a result, we don't really have the skill level to man organizations and institutions in that country. So you can have all the finest regulations and so-called institutions in the country, but if you don't have the right people to run those institutions, they will not improve things, but worsen things because they would have taken away capabilities out of the hands of people. So now that everything is trying to be decentralized in the country, it's getting more dysfunctional because we don't really, India does not, simply does not have the good people to run those uh, organizations. Yeah, I hear you. Uh Yeah. If we can go back to those, uh, the 500 and the 1,000 rupee notes, how much advance notice was given to the people to exchange the old notes for the new ones? 
Um, no, no time, actually. They were given about three or four hours and the banking system had already closed. But what then happened was that the government gave them about four months to convert their old banknotes into new banknotes over the next four months. Uh, but the problem was, sorry, next two months, but the problem was that there were massive lineups and chaos outside the banking system. So it was virtually impossible for a lot of people to go and waste their time to convert just about 20 or $30 each time that they lined up outside the banking system. So they had made it extremely difficult to convert your cash, which meant that uh, a lot of people had a huge amount of problems converting their cash. A lot of cash actually did get converted. Um, more than 99% of the cash got converted. And it's still, I don't know anyone who did not forget to convert some of the cash, which pretty much means, uh, Patrick, that a lot of uh, uh, counterfeit notes got converted into legal notes, while a lot of legal notes stayed with people who were just uh, not aware of the fact that they had hidden away some cash elsewhere and they failed to convert during those two months. A lot of people outside the country completely failed to convert their money because government of India gave them absolutely no option to convert uh, their currency. So I guess if uh, if they didn't bring the currency in, it's it's useless today? Uh, well, actually, it can land you in prison uh, because you are not supposed to own that currency anymore. And again, you can see that there is no reason why you should trust that government. And the government, people in the government don't really understand that they have there's something called the rule of law. They should have honored the commitment that they made on that currency bill, which they failed to honor, but that is actually the culture of the society and the culture of the governing, governing institutions as well, which means that nothing works and they are doing nothing to improve the working of the institutions. I'm trying to remember the people queuing in those long lines uh, at the banks, uh, but did some people queue to buy gold with the old uh, banknotes and were the gold dealers willing to accept the old banknotes? Oh, absolutely, because uh, you could backdate your transaction to the date when gold, th those currencies were still legal and a lot of backdated transactions took place. Um, now, I have photograph of what was happening for the next few days, and I actually wrote an article on that. Um, gold price went up to as much as $2,300 per ounce for the next few days because there was this much of... Um, crisis in the society. People desperately wanted to convert whatever they had into gold as soon as they could. A market that day stayed open all night because people were desperately trying to convert what was then no longer legal tender into something that they could use later uh, in life. Do you think the currency demonetization was a good way to combat tax evasion or how effective was it? Um, well, um, y you know, it, this is a very complex thing to think about. The problem is that what do you care about more? Whether, do you want to collect more taxes or do you want to do good to the society? 90 to 95 percent of Indian society works in the informal sector. Um, in my uh, hometown in northern part of India, where daily wages were about five US dollar a day are now down by about 40% in real terms, four zero percent if at all these people can get jobs, which means that the informal economy has been seriously harmed by this demonetization. Now, when you forcefully convert a society into a formal economy, the formal sector of the economy will show signs of improvement. And that has been the case with the formal sector. But remember, that can t that caters to only 10, 15% of the population, not a huge chunk of the population. And uh, yes, uh, immediately after this uh, declaration, the formal economy improved, the tax collection improved, but the life of a normal guy on the street became hugely worse over the next few months. But then, uh, Patrick, if you, it takes, does not take much imag imagination to understand that when you destroy the informal economy, which is the backbone of the 
society, you actually also eventually destroy the formal economy. So you can see that happening with a lot of uh, a couple of airlines in India crashing. Uh, Jet Airways has recently become, I think, bankrupt. Um, A lot of companies are suffering because, again, if you destroy the backbone, uh, how can you have the formal economy? And I think eventually it will come to harm every single aspect of the economy. Certainly, it will continue to harm that 90 to 95 percent of the population who are and will continue to be in informal economy. Yeah, I um, can't imagine waking up one day and uh, going through that demonetization process as as the India has. Uh, <clears throat> so I got to ask you, what? profiles of countries do you see enforcing currency demonetization today? Uh, Well, you can't really trust governments anymore, uh, Patrick. You should have never trusted your governments. Um, Governments around the world are becoming very leftist. Uh, They are under huge democratic pressures. Uh, United States, which is where I am today, Uh, United States is uh, among the most free market economies in the world. But as you can see what is happening in the U.S., U.S. is rapidly becoming a leftist country. Uh, You know that the Congress is already in the hands of the left and there are some extremely leftist elements in that emerging uh, part of the Congress. Um, so when the left does not respect private property. They does, do not respect capital and wealth. Uh, so eventually you should no longer be trusting your banking system in most countries. The only banking system I think are relatively more trustworthy are those in Switzerland and in East Asia, which is uh, Japan, Korea, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, and Taiwan. Okay, so you uh, you spent some time in the U.S. Um, from all your travels going back and forth to the U.S. over time, what what's your opinion of, of the U.S.? Why do you think it's starting to slide or move over to, to the left? And what do you think the country needs to do? Um, well, I think the real problem is with democracy. Uh, the longer democratic process continues, the more the bottom 51% of the society uh, it starts to take over the governing institutions. Now, it takes several generations to corrupt and destroy and corrode the institutions because the bureaucrats and the people who are in those institutions already take about uh, 50 years to retire from those institutions. Uh, As a result, it takes time to destroy the society. But democracy is like termite. It it has destroyed these societies. The bottom 51% of the population is interested in bread and circuses. And they are the people who want free stuff. Uh, And they don't really have the mental capacity to understand causality that free stuff does not come exist in nature and that it has to come from somewhere, which means that the government steals from one pocket of yours and give give return back to you a part of that money. But people who can't really think in a complex way think that they are getting free stuff. Now, that is increasingly happening in the U.S., um, This polarization is now huge. There is now uh, a part of the society which is very much in in favor of the free market and rapidly becoming a minority. Uh, And in my view, within the next six years, it will be the left side of the spectrum, which is, again, a very polarized society, will come to dominate the electoral process, uh, which means that uh, the whole of the U.S. governing institutions will tilt rapidly leftwards. Now, U.S. is a huge beneficiary of the best people from around the world moving to the U.S. When the U.S. become leftist, uh, these best people will stop coming to the U.S. They will stop start going to East Europe or places which are more uh, uh, friendly to good people. Uh, and as a result, I think the free market will very rapidly convert into a very socialist, communist kind of uh, society uh, once I think Trump is gone. Yeah, I hear you. Um, There's, yeah, I hear you. Um, So with with these things going on, um, oftentimes we hear of a cashless society uh, as a way for governments to to control their, their, their people more. Are you in favor of a cashless society or do you still see relevance for cash? 
Uh, well, I don't see why government should force people to go cashless. If people prefer to be cashless, it's their choice. But forcing people to become cashless so that government can control what people own is an extremely immoral way to run a society. Uh, and it leads to immorality increasing in any society, dysfunctionality increasing in every society. And you actually see that this top-down attempt to control society means that a lot of big institutions in the West no longer work. Um, I doubt if the U.S. is any more capable of building another Hoover Dam, for example, uh, because they have uh, destroyed this um, uh, uh, spirit of people in many ways. Um, so no, governments have no reason to force people to go cashless, and there's no reason to, for them to force people to go, go cashless just for the sake of increasing tax collection. What we should all do is to do everything that improves the society, not the government. Okay. Um, but with these things going on um, politically, uh, geopolitically, do you see a greater need for people to hold wealth in physical gold and silver? Well, absolutely. Um, see, if you have uh, savings, you have two or three choices. You can buy properties, and properties around the world have become extremely expensive. They don't really make much sense to me. You can invest in companies and wealth-creating activities. You can buy stocks. Uh, but that game is not for everyone. Not everyone understands the stock market. Most people actually lose money investing in the stock market. Uh, and then the last one of the last choices you have you are left with is to hold something physical, some commodity with you which can preserve your wealth. Now that could be gold, that could be copper, that could be nickel, uh, but it seems that gold and silver are probably the best way to preserve your wealth uh, because uh, they are in concentrated form. Uh, a large quantity of copper would occupy a huge amount of space and it would be very hard to buy a large quantity of copper and to sell large quantity of copper. So uh, yes, I think people should continue to look at gold as a way to preserve their wealth. They should also worry about how to protect that gold from getting it stolen. If they keep their gold in bank lockers, or if they keep their gold uh, buried in their houses, it might be in at huge risk. So uh, I actually advise people to uh, make sure that they also think about how they protect their gold from getting it stolen. Okay. So you, you see two sides. You see how uh, people in India think of gold. You see how people in the U.S. think of gold. Huge difference. Um, and not necessarily. I think uh, people who are savers think about saving their protecting their money. Uh, in a relatively better economy, savers have an incentive to save their money in wealth creating activities. Um, in dysfunctional economies of the Middle East and of the Indian subcontinent, they actually have no choice because there are no wealth creating activities that they can invest their money in. As a result, they mostly focus on gold and silver. Uh, United States, as I said, is a great economy. And if you can, if you have competencies, but that is only true if you have competencies, if you have competencies to look for and find out wealth creating activities also keep your money in wealth creating activities, but increasingly it will tilt to the side of gold because economy will become increasingly dysfunctional as socialist and communists start taking over the governing institutions in the US. Okay, uh, <clears throat> last question, Jayant. What does India need to do to uh, turn things around and you're in the US, what do you think the US needs to do to turn things around? Um, well, uh, for the U.S., the simplest uh, suggestion would be to end democracy and bring elites back into power. And elites, I hear, mean uh, people who are rational thinkers, who are really interested in public policy, who believe in the rule of law, who like wealth creation and creation of intellectual property. Uh, people who 
want greater good of the society and who do not want to pamper voters with free stuff. So power should go into the hands of the right people in the U.S. And U.S. is a great society. That is the only way to protect the U.S. Now, for India, there are no such people. The best people of India have a tendency to leave for the Western society. They move to Singapore and Hong Kong, as you know, Patrick, very well. Um, and the end result is that uh, India is an increasingly brain dead society. India never had leaders in the first place, and now we have fewer and fewer leaders. In my view, the only and the only way out for India is to beg the British to come back and rule that country again. Now, that is still a figurative statement because uh, British is British are no longer capable of ruling their own country anymore. So. Uh, it, this is an extraordinarily difficult situation. Uh, these third world countries are not only lacking in leaders, they are becoming worse in terms of having leaders, and they comprise of 5 billion out of 7.5 billion population of humanity. And uh, I think the only future I can see for these countries is that they will implode, there will be civil wars, there will be billions of people dying of hunger and other calamities. So unfortunately, I don't really see uh, a future for India. It's a very dark future that uh, I think India has. Okay. Uh, tough words to hear all the way around, but um, I, I would say it's an honest opinion. So we, we do thank you for that. Uh, before we wrap up, Jayant, can you let our listeners know more about your website and what are you working on these days? Um, I advise institutional investors on investing in uh, junior mining companies, and also I advise them uh, sometimes to invest uh, in the stock market in Singapore and in Hong Kong. Uh, I do a fair bit of writing on public policies, cultures, and economics, uh, and everything that I do can be found on my website, which is jayanthpandari.com. Okay, Jayant, we, we appreciate your time again. Uh, you have a safe stay in the States, and we look forward to seeing you again in Singapore. Uh, thank you for your time, and we wish you a great day. Thanks for the opportunity, Patrick. That was Jayant Bandari of Anarcho Capital. For more of his insights on precious metals and the global economy, please visit his website, jayantbandari.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.